Okay, so welcome back to Chapter 7, Forest and Mineral Resources, Materials to Make Stuff. In this chapter, we're going to look at both forest and minerals and how they play a role both in our everyday lives and, you know, where they come from, how they're extracted and, you know, sort of the ramifications both socially and environmentally as to how they're being used and, our, you know, their sustainability. So let's get started. Forest resources provide timber, wood, paper, and also other non-timber products as well. Now, forests are a huge part of the Earth's ecosystems, which you'll see as we go along. And about 1.5 billion people rely on the forest for their livelihood, um, whether it be you know collecting or you know cutting down trees for cooking or you know heating. That's a lot of people, you know, we think of wood as paper products and stuff like that, but there are people out there that, you know, that's what, that's how they survive. And forests like the oceans, although the oceans have more, provide one of the largest uh, biodiverse, the biodiverse ecosystems in the world. So there's a lot going on and in, in much more going on in forests than you even think of, for example, the, you know, forests provide soil conservation and buffering of aquatic systems. This is a huge problem in areas with like steep terrain or uh, uh, where you just had recent wildfires, especially out in California. Once the trees are gone, they're burned away or cut off, you know, cut and deforested, there's nothing holding the soil in there. So that soil gets washed away, eroded away, and into the aquatic systems where those sediments can choke off the aquatic systems like plants and fish. So the, 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 the forests play numerous roles, both from a human aspect and just from a biodiversity ecosystem aspect. Now here's the crazy stat. Roughly 18 million acres of forest are cut each are lost each year, which is roughly the size of Pan the country of Panama. That's a lot of forest every year. And it's become a widespread issue that, that's been there for years. And, you know, it, it doesn't really show much signs of slowing down. And the reasons for that I'll show as we go along here. So first, let's look at the actual uh, wood products that you get from the forest. So the timber is sort of the collective term for everything that the tree has, um, including the, the wood and the bark itself. Now, the lumber, what we call lumber is, you know, when they cut it into boards, plywood for vene and veneers, you know, using it for human re uh, construction, things like that. That's what lumber is. Now, there's two main kinds of wood. There's the softwoods and then there's hardwoods. Now, the bulk of the logging industry is actually softwoods for various reasons, including they grow a little faster so you can replenish your supply, but also um, the, the softwoods are used more in things like the paper industry um, because uh, the the wood is easier to sort of break down. So softwoods include things like pine trees and fir trees and birch trees. These are used primarily in paper or paper processing. Now hardwood trees are typically those that have leaves that fall every year, um, like we have right now, uh, and used for things like high-end furniture. Hardwoods are, you know, they have a much more densely packed wood structure that give them that hard, you know, good for construction type thing when you want something sturdy. My wife and I have a dresser that was built from uh, P Penny Mustard. I think it was called PM Bedroom Gallery at the time. But those things are built like tanks. It's the kind of thing that you can hand down to your kids. You know, they, they just, they're built very well. You also have pulp, which comes from the trees. And that's sort of the extracted wood fibers that are used in paper making because the fibers are heated, rolled, and then pressed into various types of paper. Um, you know, and we use paper every day in various forms, whether it be toilet paper, paper towel, um, you know, obviously paper for writing on. So there's all the different kinds of paper, and those processes all start with that wood fiber pulp. 
And something I actually didn't know is that the U.S. is the largest producer of timber products. So we have huge logging operations um, all over the country. However, on the flip side of that, we also have a lot, so probably some of the largest replanting efforts as well to renew those trees. There are a lot of products that are non-wood related or non-timber products, NTFP, that include things like nuts, berries, syrup, and mushrooms. Now, these there are a lot of places in the world that where people rely on these types of um, non-timber products for their livelihood. You know, they're foragers or gatherers where they, they go out and get berries and mushrooms and nuts and things like that, whatever's available in the forest where they live. Um, you could see in the pictures here, this is a maple tree with the, the with a tap and then the cans are sitting there so the, the maple sap can come out and then be refined into syrup. Here you have some nuts here and over here we have mushrooms. Now mushrooms you got to be very careful with obviously because you eat the wrong ones and you could die. Now I added this one here and maybe you've seen this, maybe you haven't. A lot of us love cinnamon. I love cinnamon cinnamon is one of my favorite things that comes from the bark of a tree the bark so when you're eating cinnamon it's ground up dried up bark it's very yummy bark but it's bark so that's a, a spice that we consider along with things like allspice and wintergreen all of these things come from forest ecosystems now another huge part of the forest that's non-timber related is a lot of the plants that are under the trees are used for medicinal purposes. Around 25% of all of the prescription medicines are based on compounds found in plants in forest ecosystems. That's roughly $300 billion a year for pharmaceutical companies. And these plants are found all over the world. And in fact, they go out, they have search parties essentially to look for new plants to see if those could be used in drugs down the road. Um, it, it's pretty interesting stuff and there's a lot of money behind it obviously because if you sort of hit the holy grail to find that one drug that could cure cancer for example you're going to make billions of dollars off of that so there, there's a huge effort to go out in these forested areas to find these new plants these new species of plants that they've never found before now, one of the better thing, good things about these uh, non-timber products is, for the most part, a lot of them that are harvested, you don't need to harvest the whole plant. You don't need to cut down a tree for maple syrup. You don't need to cut down the tree for cinnamon. It's the bark. You just shave off the bark. Same thing with berries and nuts. So you're not killing the plant. You're just harvesting the fruits of those plants. So that makes them automatically renewable. Obviously, mushrooms are a bit different story, unless you're just taking the caps, but I don't know if they regrow caps. But mushrooms are pretty prolific. You're not going to probably run out of mushrooms very often. Now, beyond the wood and non-timber products that you can get from a forest, they also provide several ecosystem services. Um, obviously, uh, Diversity in habitats for wildlife is a huge part of that. All forests, whether it be in temperate climate like we are or the Amazon rainforest, there are a large amount of different uh, wildlife found in these particular forests. You can see that in the little picture there. Um, that, I, I wish I could make it bigger, but it, it would have gotten pixelated. So those are some things that are found in a typical forest that we'd find here in Wisconsin, um, in the northern sort of hemispheres, hemisphere. Um, the types of birds, snakes, amphibians, bears, frogs, fish. So these are things that we'd see around here. Now, if you took that and put it down in the Amazon, that picture would look a lot different. You'd have crocodiles, piranhas, <laughs> you know, pythons, things like that. So, but the point is, is no matter what forest you're in, you're going to find lots of different type of wildlife. Another part of the forest is, a, you know, the 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 uh, sucking up of the CO2 in the air, you know, the lungs of the earth are the forest. We're pumping just tons and ton millions of tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every day with our cars, with our factories, everything. And the more trees you have, the more it can keep up with all of that CO2. 
So when we're taking away the trees, we're taking away Earth's ability to suck up all that carbon dioxide and through photosynthesis convert it back into oxygen, which is what we want. The forest ecosystem also protects watersheds and the rivers. It creates sort of a buffer between them um, in terms of you know, pollutants and things like that. It can suck up some of those pollutants before it gets to areas where a drinking water might be a problem. It can also prevent erosion. Um, that erosion eventually leads to eutrophication, which, uh, which we talked about earlier, where you have all those big green algal blooms. You have all the sediment and everything that goes in, all of those toxic chemicals that raises the amount of nitrogen in the water that chokes off the fish and creates these green, all that green algae, which chokes off plants and fish. And then finally, a small thing, but it's a thing, is that it provides a lot of social benefits such as recreational areas, right? Where do we typically go for a hike or for you know a picnic or something like that? A lot of times we go to these types of forested areas or rivers or lakes or whatever it is because just from a human aspect, they're pretty, right? They, they make us feel good. We wanna go to those places, explore them, hike, whatever. So while that might be a smaller reason as opposed to, let's say, the lungs of the earth, um, it's still, from a societal point of view, is a big deal. Now, you can't talk about forests without talking about climate change. They go hand in hand because, like I mentioned, the forests are the lungs of the earth. So the lungs, being the forests, we're pumping all the CO2, you take away the forests and they just don't have the ability to keep up. So that's that's a huge problem. Um, obviously, we looked at the energy sources with the fossil fuels and all that, you know, trying to come up with more and more alternative energy sources will help lower the amount of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, which gives the trees that are remaining a better ability to suck up all that CO2, but it's still heavily weighted towards the CO2 and not the trees. That's why we have global climate change. Then you have deforestation, which we'll talk about in a bit as well, um, taking place all around the world, but especially in the tropics. Brazil especially is doing it a ton. Um, and then there's several reasons for that, which we'll get to in the next slides. So if you look at this map, this map shows you sort of the breakdown of why the deforestation in the Amazon is taking place. Now it's a little bit old, it's 2000 to 2005, but the reasons are still there and they're still the same. Now overwhelming 60% of that is cattle ranches, whereas you have you know 1% of large scale commercial agriculture. Well, there's many reasons for that. One of the things is, and we'll see it in the next slide, is the, the the world's uh, appetite for beef. Cows need room to grow, or excuse me, room to graze. <laughs> and therefore, you have to cut down trees and give them space in order to do that. Um, the next one is the 33% there, which is the subsidence agriculture, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, and that's, that's prevalent, especially in poorer areas, um, due to the fact that you're in a rainforest and the rainforest doesn't, the soil in a rainforest you would think is great, but it really isn't because the water washes it away. And I'll explain that in the next slide a bit more. Then you have illegal and legal logging operations, things like that. But the vast majority of the deforestation taking place in the Amazon rainforest is to make way for cattle. Cattle, you know, what do we get from cattle? We get beef. Now in these countries, they know now that beef comes at a high premium. These cattle farms are, who's buying all this beef? America, specifically places like McDonald's, Burger King, the big chains, you know, you talk about all the McDonald's and all over the world serving all those burgers every day. They have to get that beef some, from somewhere and they don't care where they get it from as long as it's safe and they can get it, right? And so, the people in these countries, they're developing countries, they know they can make money from this, they don't understand the environmental ramifications of it, so they're just doing it to uh, get, you know, make a living.
population growth is a huge factor for having less forests overall. And we saw that even in our country when you know we first came over here and um, the, the England the colonials started moving west, they they chopped down a lot of trees because they needed them to build houses, to you know for wood, for heating and cooking. A lot of trees were chopped down in this country. Now, if you look at this particular graph, this is Thailand. So this is the population that's growing, 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 growing just since 1940 or so. And as you can see, the amount of forests have gone down, 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 and down because as you your population grows, what do you need? You need wood to for you know cooking, heating, but even more importantly, do in the in the last 30 years or so, 40 years is urbanization. You have to build houses for all these people, you know, with the population explosion. And then on top of that, you have um, the the demand for beef. So you're clear cutting forests in other areas, like I mentioned, Brazil is the biggest one. And then you. It, what you saw in the previous graph with the subsidence farming, what that is, is smaller farmers who take a plot of land and they clear, they burn it, they burn everything down. Now, one of the weird things about the uh, rainforest is you would think with all that rain, you'd have great soil. The problem is, is with all that rain, the rain washes away all the nutrients in the soil. So while it can sustain, um, you know, the trees, because the root systems go way down on down into the ground, crops or cash crops, let's say like corn or something like that, they're not as well uh, adapted to that kind of soil because all of it gets washed away all the time from the constant rain every day in the tropics. So what these farmers do is they find a plot of land, they burn it down, and then they plant crops on the ashes of where it burned down. Now, in the short term, what that does is it creates an, a, a situation where those ashes carry nutrients. It grows the crops for maybe a couple of years, and then it starts to lose its uh, ability to sustain crops. So what do they do? They move on to the next plot of land. They just abandon it. They just move on. They start another fire, grow the crops, and, then, and so you have this, this land that's just abandoned, and once they abandon it, nothing can grow there. Nothing's going to grow. There's no nutrients left in the soil, and there's no trees around to help sort of build it back up. So this is, while it's not as big of a problem as the cattle ranching, it's still a huge problem in the Amazon rainforest. Now, a lot of these countries that are doing these type of uh, either subsidence farming or clear cutting for cattle ranches, there's a lot, they're poorer nations and there's a lot of poverty. So how do you tell someone, hey, you can't do this because um, it's, it's environmentally unsound and it's gonna create all kinds of issues. You're taking away the earth's ability to reduce global climate change. How do you tell that to somebody who's just trying to survive? And that's part of the problem that, especially in the Brazil, in the Amazon rainforest, these people just, they don't know anything else. They need the wood to cook with, to heat with, to, you know, uh, to, you know, if they want to make any kind of money, they need cattle, you know, places to graze cattle. So that's a huge, it's a cyclical thing. You know, you can't tell somebody that they can't survive because the environment's going to be ruined, but at the same time, they're ruining the environment so they could survive. So there's no right or wrong. It's just that it's sort of this vicious cycle. Now, there are political and market forces that also take place with this. And then you can see in this picture is a great example. That's the Amazon rainforest. And right in the middle there, you have just an area that's com been completely devoid of trees. So, <laughs> you know, that's probably a huge area. Now, it doesn't look big compared to the rest of the area around it. But that's probably thousands and thousands of trees that have been removed that you, know, and you take all those trees and remove them. That's a little less that uh, CO2 that's being sucked up. It's a little less biodiversity that's taking place. So and there's that's more erosion that's taking place. So in, increased market demand has motivated governments to incentivize. What that means is here, we'll give you money to open up things like cash crops or cattle farms 
Um, and that's so that that's a huge part of why you have all these cattle farms is, you know, the, everybody makes money off of it. The, the farmer makes money from the cattle. The country makes money from the taxes on the cattle. And then McDonald's, and I'm not trying to demonize McDonald's. I'm just using them as an example because they're a huge chain. They're making money on the beef that was supplied from these farmers. Another um, problem with this is a lot of times when this clear cutting takes place, you're, you're moving entire uh, farmers, okay? So the, you move these farmers from where they're used to living. Now they have no other option to, than to start subsidence farming. They don't know what else to do. They need to survive. So they start slashing and burning, planting crops, moving on, slashing, burning, planting crops. So that's another problem. That's sort of uh, like a snowball effect. When you have these large areas that are clear cut, you're, somebody, if there's anybody living there, they have to move out, okay? In developing countries, government corruption is always a problem. You know, we, 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 there's corruption in every government, but when you are a developing nation, it seems to be even more pervasive. There's more of it. So these governments, they know that um, deforestation is wrong, but they also know they'll approve it because they, you know, the money, and they turn a blind eye to things like illegal logging operations. And then finally, you know, as countries like developing countries get more and more in debt and all countries are in debt but as they get more and more in debt what they start to do is liquidate or sell off their their natural resources whether it be timber or minerals for very low prices with little regard to the environmental aspect uh the ramifications of that so it's again it's a snowball thing everybody's trying to survive make money sort of get a leg up and unfortunately the environment takes a backseat to all of this and ends up being you know the thing that's hurt the most so how do we sustain these forests okay well the obvious solution is to slow down the rates of deforestation again that's easier said than done because how do you go in there as a country let's say as a u.s and tell brazil hey you can't do this you can't cut down forests in your own uh backyard that's not going to fly we wouldn't want some other country to come in us and tell us to do that so it's really hard to do that so what you have to do is address those social economic and geopolitical forces that are responsible for it you know try to educate the local governments and the local citizens hey, this is what's going on. We have a better way of doing it that where you still might make money. And, you know, trying to take the political part out of it, get rid of that corruption, you know, and start to look at more sustainable ways of, uh, of maintaining the forests. Now, slowing population growth is the holy grail of this, right? That's easier said than done as well. You know, China is one of the only countries that's actually, that I know of, I, has an has enacted a uh, a child law where you can only have like one kid because they have well over a billion people in China and it's going to get harder and harder to feed all those people. Um, educating, you know, like I said, the local people, changing the land tenure process uh, policies, and it talks about this in the book where a lot of times this land is handed down from generation to generation and every time that land grows and grows and grows to the point where only a few people might own the majority of the land around and elim just like in, a, in america eliminate the subsidies for the large-scale agricultural projects you know level the playing field so it slows down that deforestation and then you got to look at the other end of it too, right? You can't just go in and tell Brazil to stop doing these things. We, as the consumer of those particular products, have to slow down as well, okay? So the consumption end of it has to be slowed uh, worldwide, not just I'm just, not just the U.S., but the 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 appetite for beef and the, you know the paper and all this, all of this has to be slowed down because that will drive the market to a point where they have to slow down, the producers have to slow down. So as long as there's a high, you know, a, a high value on getting these products, there's gonna be a high value on producing these products. It's simple market F, uh, forces at play. 
So there's lots of management solutions, and I'm not going to read all this, but hopefully you can see that you have to attack this from many different angles, um, whether it be uh, resources, biological diversity, um, you know, socioeconomic functions. There's a lot that play a role in this, and um, you know, the, the for you have to kind of convince people that the forests are more than just trees you know, that you can cut down for things. They, they play a bigger role than that. So you have to convince people in various different ways how to do that. Um, managing forests, I'm gonna read this second bullet point. Managing forests sustainably means optimizing their benefits, including timber and contributions to food security to meet society's needs in a way that conserves and maintains forest ecosystems for the benefit of present and future generations. That's it in a nutshell. Now, how you do that is a multifaceted thing, like you could see in, in this particular diagram. It's not just one plan of attack. You have to be able to sort of uh, come at it from different angles where different entities have a role to play in overall sustainable ma uh, forest management. So let's look at some of the solutions that have come, been come up with. Um, things like decentralizing and deprivatizing forest management and putting it in the hands of the government. Now, a lot of times when you let the government run things, it doesn't go very well. But when it comes to you know forests and things like that, it's kind of hard to screw up and take it out of the hands of the private citizens. So um, that takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. The problem with having it in private citizens' hands is you have things like you know extortion and you know there's a lot of things that can go wrong with that. Use an ecosystem approach to manage land and water and living resources that promote conservation. So, you know, an example of that is rather than cutting every tree down, let's cut down the ones that are the biggest, right? If you have to clear cut or if you have to cut trees down, cut down the big ones, the oldest ones, let the new, the middle ones keep growing. And then where the oldest ones were, um, you plant new ones. You know, that makes sense, right? It's not always that easy, we know, but it, it makes sense. Allow for third party certification. This is actually, you'll see this in the mineral section as well. Um, it's kind of like the fair, fair trade deal that we talked about before. If, you know, allow the, the consumer to pay a, a little bit more to know that the products that they're buying were done in a, a sustainable and responsible way. And you'll see again, this again in the mineral section. So this allows the consumers to know the origin of the product and take responsibility, sort of that social justice uh, mentality when purchasing products. So that's a good thing as well. Now here's one that I, you know, I didn't think of, um, and it kind of explains the picture that you see here on the right. Allow the indigenous people to profit from their knowledge of the medicinal value of the for that the forest can provide. All right. What does that mean? A lot of the people that live in these forests, they already know which plants will heal things. They already know that. They've known it for thousands of years. However, the drug companies don't. They want to know. So let it be this, this uh, relationship that benefits everybody. So let the indigenous people guide them as to, okay, this plant does this, this, and this, and then allow the drug companies to make the compounds and when the drug companies make their profits give some of those back to the indigenous people it's a win-win for everybody okay um, and then put some of those profits back into conservation efforts as well so again you don't want to use up every plant that does whatever you know that heals this particular ailment you want to be able to, to replant it and use it again and again and again so that's sort of the idea behind this. Make it slick, cyclical. Let the people tell the drug companies what works. Let the drug companies make what works and then let everybody enjoy the profits. Now, obviously, the profits are going to be skewed towards the drug companies, but throw a little back at those indigenous people because without them, you wouldn't have known where to look. And finally, obviously, this goes without saying, promote recycling. Recycle your paper. Make it more, you know, 
there's better and better systems all the time for recycling cardboard and paper. Make sure you're doing that. It's such a simple little thing. Am I perfect at it? No, but I do try really hard and I yell at my kids and wife to make sure that what needs to be recycled goes in the recycling bin. Another option for um, reducing rates of deforestation is all using uh, coming up with alternatives to forest resources. And there have been many efforts to do this, especially in the construction industry with things like developing um, construction materials that use less and less um, uh, fiber, like that need less wood and could be used um, as a uh, an alternative to things like wood insulation and drywall. So they have these new concrete, aerated concretes that, you know, when they're reinforced, can be just as good if not better and last longer and keep out pests and mold and things like that than wood insulation or drywall wood. Recycling plastics, okay? We've already seen this, but you'll see it more as years go on. You can now buy fences and decking that's made completely of recycled materials. We see this all the time and it's great to see. You know, they use, you know, recycled tires for things, you know, um, use plants for pulp as opposed to tree. Things like hemp, cork, straw, and bamboo, which is a big one. We'll talk more about bamboo in a second. Um, can be alternatives for making flooring and fiberboard for construction. Now, bamboo is considered one of the most sustainable sources of fiber because it grows well and it is very strong stuff, right? Um, you'll see in the book, there's a uh, entrepreneurial uh, sort of background with bamboo and, and one of the things that they came up with was utilizing bamboo to make bikes bicycles okay bamboo is very very strong it is very strong stuff if you ever try to break bamboo it's almost impossible so utilizing that fact to use indigenous materials to create something like a bike which in a lot of areas of the world that's their only mode of transportation. So why not use the materials that are readily available to make something that'll get you around that also has zero emissions. So it's sort of this win-win-win with bamboo. It's becoming more and more prevalent in figuring out ways to create sustainable um, materials. Okay, so now we're gonna switch over to our mineral resource sustainability. So the forests obviously, you know, you can't stress enough about, especially with the deforestation, that needs to slow down. But what about minerals? Now, minerals, <laughs> we use them every day in everything. The computer I'm running this on right now has lots of minerals in it, right? Our cars, everything. We'll talk about this as we go along. Um, and then how to, you know, the policies and how to make mineral sustainability a real thing. This one's a bit harder though, as you'll see as we go along. It's a bit more difficult to uh, nail down. So let's just start off first of all, what are minerals, okay? This is geology right here, 101. So uh, it must be naturally occurring, inorganic, so there's no organic matter. It has to be solid, a composite, chemical composition and an ordered internal structure, okay? Those are all, and then it goes through and defines all those. Um, so if you were taking a geology class, a basic geology class, you would have to know this. Now, what you'll see in the pictures there wasn't planned at first, but as I was perusing pictures to put in here, um, I came across a website. <laughs> so the, there was a website I found that had like the nine most deadly minerals. Um, and so I, I figured, why, well, why not? So the blue fibrous one you have there. Now, I'll tell you this right now in our little mineral museum, mineral and fossil museum at UWM, we, we have all this stuff um, in there. So the, the one is calcanthrite, uh, which is a, uh, the, the blue one, which is a copper sulfide, which dissolves easily and then can get into everything and cause huge like sulfuric acid problems. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the bright orange one is called orpiment, which has a lot of sulfur in it and arsenic. <laughs> so it's nasty stuff. Um, and then you have this beautiful red crystal there, uh, which those are actually pretty rare, but the, the crystals are the bigger crystals are, but that's cinnabar and cinnabar is where we get mercury, which is highly toxic. 
So while all three of those minerals are absolutely gorgeous, they are, they're all highly toxic to the human body and the environment, unfortunately. So I, I just put those in there. But so you have to understand what a mineral is in order to understand why we need them. So mineral sources, there are roughly 5,000 minerals that we know of, okay? And, but only about 20 of them are mined for economic uh, purposes, including things like iron, aluminum, zinc, manganese, copper, nickel, lead, just to name a few. There's some more on that list as well. So those are what are mined for things like, you know, iron to make steel, to make cars and buildings and bridges. Um, zinc is used in, uh, with, uh, to make things like brass, manganese, copper, you know, copper tubing, copper wiring. Um, Nickel is used in a lot of things for hardening and stuff like that. There's also another 20 that are mined because they have value, including gems, like things like diamonds, rubies, sapphires, and emeralds. And you have all four of those sitting there. So the blue one is the sapphire. The red one is the ruby. This is our diamond. And then obviously the green one is the emerald. Uh, emerald is my birthstone, uh, which is in May. Um, now... The, it, just as a side note, I'm trying to erase these circles here. As a side note, um, ruby, rubies and sapphires come from the same parent mi mineral. They're both uh, what's called corundum. It's just a matter of uh, um, the impurities in them that change the color. <laughs> so there's also rare earth minerals, which we're actually going to talk quite a bit about. Uh, it's a collection of about 17 mineral elements that are used a lot, especially in technology like cell phones and computers. Now, uh, rare earth minerals, they're called that, but they're actually not that rare um, in terms of where how they can be found. And, uh, you know, what you'll see is China dominates the market for those, which we'll get to in a bit. Now, reading from the book, I thought this was a pretty interesting stat. The average automobile today contains roughly 40 different minerals, including almost 2,000 pounds of iron. So think about that when you're driving your car, all the different minerals that went into that to make it. We talked about the catalytic converter earlier this semester with the rhodium and the palladium and the platinum, you know, and then there's iron and aluminum, and, you know, all different kinds of minerals that are going to be found uh, in your car. Silicon is one. But are mi mineral resources sustainable? Well, minerals themselves are non-renewable, at least on a human time scale, because they're formed over millions of years. Now, their sustainability is a function of whether or not there's enough in the Earth's crust and then how much demand there is for it. For example, right now there are hundreds of years of iron left at the current consumption rate, but if that goes up, then there'll be less, you know, less time. There are the rare earth elements are less abundant, but now they're in higher demand. Okay, so that A drives up the price, but also, you know, every, there's a scramble to find these things around the world. Uh, in order to use them, especially, like I said, in our, all of our tech, today's technology. Now, there are actually some that are considered endangered minerals, things like gold, silver, silver mercury, sulfur, tin, tungsten, and zinc. Okay, uh, gold and silver, for obvious reasons, especially gold, is used a lot in, in a lot of different things. It's a great conductor for, of electricity. Uh, mercury is used in other things quite a bit in terms of like mining for gold, you need mercury to mine for gold. Um, sulfur is used a lot in, in the chemical industry. Uh, so it's, it's you know, th these are considered endangered because they're being extracted faster uh, than, you know, uh, than there's enough left. Now, the last thing, is not all mineral resources are distributed equally around the country. China has a ton of mineral resources, especially the rare earth minerals, where they hold about 85% of all of the rare earth minerals on earth right now. And that creates things like mineral cartels, uh, essentially a monopoly and price fixing and things like that. 
So you, because they control all of the uh, supply or nearly all of the supply. So there's right now I, in you know finding these images and reading a bit online, there's a mad dash to find these rare earth elements in other localities around the world. Unfortunately, there's only, so far, they've only found a few places in the US that actually has these. Now, what are the impacts of mining? And there's quite a few. Um, the scars on the landscape, including mountaintop removal, which we talked about when we talked about coal. Um, it, you know, mining contaminates the air with toxic particles and dust that gets in the air and causes those same toxic compounds to percolate into the groundwater. So there's a lot of downsides uh, to mining, um, including the biggest, one of the biggest ones is the incredible amount of waste material, what we call tailings. Tailings are the, you know, the, what they don't need that they dug out. So if you're looking for, you know, certain minerals, they're called, you know, they're pretty rare. The bulk majority of what you're digging up doesn't contain what you're looking for. You So you just kind of throw it aside. And those are the tailings. Those tailings have other toxic compounds, including lead, uranium, zinc, and arsenic, which then the rain hits on, it goes into the water system and can, uh, can pollute soil and aquatic systems. And uh, the, the worst one is, one of the worst ones is when the tailings contain enough sulfides to get in the water and creating a sulfuric acid situation that can kill entire aquatic systems. And this was a huge problem, especially in, uh, in the industrial revolution up through about the 60s and 70s, when they finally started to realize what's going on. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, Many mines, not all mines, but many mines use, require enormous amounts of water, which is a limited resource. And that water usually doesn't come back clean. It comes back very dirty, in fact. So uh, these are all, um, you know, the, n the downsides of mining. And there are quite a few. Uh, there's a few more we'll get into later on. So you can see in the images here, these are this huge pile here. You know, this is an Australian mine, I believe. Just mounds and mounds and piles of, um, you know, tailings. It's what they, it's all the stuff they took out of the earth that they don't need. What do you do with it all? And there are some, have been some catastrophic uh, mine tailings um, uh, where it almost acts like a dam and they've given way. Uh, that just happened recently in oh i forgot where i think somewhere over in england or scotland had one and then there was one in china i want to say where you had you know all this water builds up behind these tailings they call them tailings ponds and the the weight of that water just becomes too much it goes poof right out into the the river systems and contaminates everything down river now another environmental impact to the, uh, once the minerals have been extracted out of the ground is how do you get make them worth something to use and that's processing of minerals so once they're extracted you have to separate the ore from the mineral you're trying to get at and a lot of times this requires either heat or a chemical process so mineral processing is one of the largest users of energy worldwide I mean they're you know when they do things they do them on large scales as you can see in the picture the upper picture there that's a smelting operation up in Canada. <clears throat> now, smelting is heating the rock to a, certain, a seriously high temperature to get out all the impurities. The impurities are what you're actually looking for. And then you have this waste product called slag. Now, the problem with smelting is, is it creates an enormous amount of um, air pollution, really bad air pollution. Um, the image you can see in the lower right there, and it's not the best image in the world, is of a former smelting operation in uh, Pennsylvania that contaminated everything within like 10 miles of it. It killed trees, it killed the soil, it killed the lakes. Um, and, it, you know, it, just because it ran continuously for like 70 years, um, it just, it just, uh, created a situation where it literally deforested and contaminated everything around it. 
Now, getting back to the rare earth uh, minerals again, this has become a more recent issue, especially because of, again, all of the the technology uses that these rare earth uh, minerals are needed for. Um, now they're high in value and they're often mined illegally with no environment, often with no little or no environmental or health precautions. Um, chi like I mentioned, China uh, sort of had corners the market on this stuff and does little to encourage or enforce environmental standards, although that is slowly changing. They're getting a lot of pressure from around the world to clean up their act on this. So in order to produce, let's give you the numbers here. In order to produce one ton of rare earth metals, it requires approximately 2,000 tons of toxic waste material. And that doesn't even include all the water that's used to help extract those metals. So think about that. One ton of rare earth metals, 2,000 tons of uh, you know solid uh, waste, and then it's just massive amounts of water waste. Now, those, the, as you've seen, the rare earth metals are often found in some of the poorest areas. So they're being mined by people um, that are just sort of doing whatever they can do to survive. And, you know, obviously um, being exploited to gain, for gain in a richer uh, countries. Now, I want you to look at that picture on the lower left there. I had to I had to look that up when it, so when I looked up some photos for this. So the the mine in the upper uh, left is in China. It's one of the largest rare earth mines in the world. Um, the bottom picture is in Mongolia actually, and you can see they call that the Lake of Death. You see all that out there? All of this is all the wastewater coming off a rare earth mineral mine, as far as you can see. Nothing's ever going to grow there. Nothing's ever nothing's ever going to happen there. It's just a toxic cesspool. <laughs> Pretty nasty stuff. So another huge um, commodity is gold, and we mentioned that was on the endangered uh, minerals list. But you know, gold's been mined for you know thousands of years, and the problem with gold, at least on a large scale is that it requires some pretty nasty chemicals to extract it. So the gold mines themselves, as you can see here, this is the lar one of the largest gold mines in the world. Um, and it, I forgot where that is now. I just looked it up. <laughs> I forgot where it was. Um, it's one of the largest gold mines in the world. I think it's in, um, oh yeah, it's in, uh, in uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, that's where it is. Sorry about that. So gold mining requires a lot of mercury and cyanide to extract the gold uh, down to its purest form. And you can see in the upper picture there on the right, though all of that muddiness and that those that's though all those lakes are dead. They're filled with, you know, mercury and cyanide um, be, from all of the uh, gold that's being extracted out. So as the gold increases, the price of gold increases, so will those willing to forget about their personal health and environmental concerns to go get at it. And there's a, a little uh, part in the book here that talks about sort of these real like community driven, like the really small gold mines. People go into old abandoned mines just to get whatever they can get, you know, and those are dangerous conditions. And then using the same technology that these large mines use, but with almost no safety measures in place. So they're breathing mercury fumes. They're breathing cyanide fumes. So that isn't going to bode well very long for those people. They're going to die much, much quicker than the rest of us because, you know, like a, mercury and cyanide are nasty, nasty things. So unfortunately, <laughs> you know, we all like gold. You know, we use it for jewelry and things like that. Little did you know, you know, what it takes to actually get gold out of the ground is a very hazardous uh, uh, way of producing it. Well, you can't talk about mines and minerals without talking about conflict minerals. Now, the most obvious one of this is what are called blood diamonds, and I'll talk about that in a second. But minerals are mined, conflict minerals are mined in conditions where armed conflict um, in areas where there might be civil war, and then they're sold to support that. So these minerals are sold to buy more guns to support the, let's say, civil war. 
a lot of these are typically in Africa, unfortunately, because the governments there are just unstable. Not always, but the bulk of the majority of them are. Um, and these are uh, the people that are working them are often enslaved. They're like on the other side of the Civil War. They're enslaved or forced at gunpoint. They're otherwise threatened to work at them. And the most, you know, there was a movie based on this uh, called Blood Diamonds, I believe, with Leonardo DiCaprio in it that originated in, you know, these uh, countries where, you know, you have these civil wars taking places, taking place, and all these people are basically slaves to find these diamonds in places like Angola or Ivory Coast. And it's it's really, really unfortunate that this, this is taking place. But there are buyers for these uh, minerals, and that's where we'll talk a little bit later about uh, in the policy section how in order to mitigate this, you have to cut off the buyers. As long as there's a market for the diamonds, as you can see in the upper left uh, corner there. Now, there were other pictures I could have used. There was a picture of what looked like a child's hands with pretty much most of their fingers cut in half um, because of working in the diamond mines. And I didn't want to put anything too graphic in there, but you know, the, the, there are people being killed and enslaved and everything else to get these minerals to market to support um, either dictators or you know government takeovers or anything with an armed conflict. Now here's one that you may not have thought about, um, but this one actually hits pretty close to home. Sand. sand, there's a huge market for sand, why? Sand has become the most widely consumed natural resource on the planet after fresh water. Why is that? Well, we've been talking about it on and off all semester. The huge population shift to the urban, the urbanization of the world, people are moving to the cities. In order to move to cities, you have to be able to build new homes. In order to build new homes, you typically need concrete, concrete which requires sand. It's as simple as that. There are other aspects of this, which I'll mention, um, like fracking. Now, if you didn't know this, a lot, and I mean a huge portion of the sand that's used for fracking operations around the country and around the world, maybe, I don't know about around the world, but around the country, a lot of that sand comes from Wisconsin. And you can see these pictures, all three of those pictures are uh, sand operations here in Wisconsin. Now, there have also been some areas of the world that have developed sort of sand mafias because the one, I, I believe it's in uh, Malaysia that they use the example in the book, because these people understand that in order to make the concrete to build the cities, you need sand. They're basically saying, okay, you gotta go through us to get it. And it's not necessarily a pleasant thing in terms of, uh, you know, they'll uh, up the prices, up interest rates, things like that, and kill people who try to cut under them things like that, just like, you know, you've heard of other mafia stuff, the same thing applies to sand. Sand is a hot commodity. You wouldn't think so, but it really is. All right, how do we make minerals resources more sustainable? Is that even a possibility? There are some things that can be done to at least slow the extraction rates, but a few things that could actually be done to make them more sustainable. We're gonna talk about that as we go forward here. To look at ways to make minerals more sustainable, you have to start to change the policies that govern how minerals are mined and extracted and processed. So here in the US, we have some very old mining laws um, that really don't quite make sense. So there's one set of rules if you're on private land and another set of rules if you're on public federal lands when it comes to mining. So to change, we wanna centralize that. So one sort of one, rule fits all kind of thing to make sure everybody's on the same leveling uh, level playing field and that the regulations are then followed. Now that's here in the US. So now the next step would be to take that and institute mining regulations based on worldwide, you know, environment and health safety practices to get all of the countries on board to say, hey, here's a better way to do this, both from an environmental aspect, a social aspect and an economic one you know, how can we all do be better at making these mines more sustainable and doing the least amount of uh, damage um, as we're extracting out these necessary minerals? Now, I mentioned in the gold example, and it's in the book as well, 
as the price of gold goes up or anything like that, rare earth metals, whatever it is, there becomes a more a larger and larger market. So people are willing to take the risk to go, let's say, in abandoned uh, gold mines to go find this stuff. And then they'll, a lot of times you'll have sort of local community uh, processing plants to take it from its, you know, where you found it out in the mine and process it into, let's say, gold. Um, and there's a, a thing in the book of talking about that um, in some uh, Central American countries. Now, rather than just banning this practice altogether, uh, what you would want to do is educate them. If you ban it, the problem with that is it creates a black market that now they're doing it illegally and just it doesn't work very well. So if you educate them on better ways to extract healthy, you know, uh, minimizing health risks and uh, all of those things, it, it would go a long way to making, let's say, that village more money, but also, you know, helping the environment along the way as well and making things more sustainable. Now, just like with the forest products and with like the fair trade agreements that we talked about several chapters ago, provide certification programs for precious metals such as what we would call green gold, right? That monitor and ensure economic health and social conditions. What this is, means is that the buyer of that particular precious metals, yes, they are gonna pay a bit more, but they know that that gold was done it was extracted, or excuse me, mined and extracted in a sustainable manner. Just like you have with organic foods, with all of these other things, sort of giving it that green seal of approval would go a long way in terms of um, creating oversight, you know, to make sure that everything is done up to environmental and safety hazards. It's no different than in the organic vegetable market, right? They have to get certified. They have to prove that they're doing it organically. This would, the same thing would apply to this with let's say gold in this case. Now I'm coming back around sort of the blood diamond things. The, 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 the whole global market as a whole needs to come to grip and create policies and provisions to stop the purchase of minerals that support violence. It just needs to stop. The unfortunate reality is, is the people that are creating these blood diamonds will use those or these minerals that are uh, funding civil wars and genocides. You know, there are markets for those. And not only do we need to cut off the supply chains, you need to punish the buyers. All right, you need to go out there and find the countries that are purchasing these and punish them for doing so. Usually, you know, that's done with embargoes or trade tariffs or things like that. Um, so, or trade bans. So if let's say if uh, Russia says if we catch Russia buying these, say we're not, we're not gonna, we're gonna stop all of our exports until you stop buying these minerals and you can prove that you're doing it. Now that's an extreme example, but you get the idea. There are also some technical and innovative solutions to help minimize the amount of min uh, minerals that are you know, being extracted. Well, first of all, we have to look at decreasing the demand. And the first thing to do is decrease the um, uh, consumption and look at innovative ways to make products last longer. You know, things like batteries. What can you do to make a battery last longer? Because batteries have you know, things like lithium and cadmium, which are toxic, but they're also not just abundant everywhere. You know, the, those are minerals that, you know, they're not as easily found as let's say iron is. Or, you know, make products like cars last longer. Now, most cars last 10 to 12 years. My, my car's 10 years old and it's starting to fall apart. What are ways you can figure out to make them last 15, 20 years longer? Because what that would do is require less to be extracted out of the ground. Find non-metal, also you could find non-metal alternatives such as glass ceramics that are almost as strong as steel. They've even looked at looking uh, using ceramics in engines. I mean, that would be pretty crazy when you think about it. If they can stand up to the heat and the motion of, of the engines, that would go a long way to uh, alleviate a, a lot of the materials that would be needed to build an engine. Recycling, obviously. You know, we have the, you know, recycling steel and iron and aluminum is easy. What becomes more difficult 
is where you get things like TVs and electronics, um, like cell phones, for example, which have shelf lives. You know, people buy new cell phones almost every other year, pretty much, or like a year and a half. Well, there's a lot of rare earth minerals in those cell phones, which is why the price has gone up, which is why there's more and more rare earth, rare earth minerals being mined, excuse me. So um, it's, a, it's a cyclical thing, it's a snowball effect. So finding ways, and there are people working on this, finding ways to recycle the minerals found in the cell phones and TVs. <clears throat> um, sustainable mining practices in terms of you know, conservation and reclamation of water. So try not to use as much water. And then with the water that you are using, how can you reuse it? That's what reclamation is. How can you reuse the water to, again, either for the same purpose or some other purpose? You can't just take that water with all the toxic compounds in it and just flush it away. That's not good. And you might not be able to use that water again to flush away what you need to extract the ore, but figure out some happy medium to minimize the amount of water being used. <clears throat> now there's some other, you know, another uh, aspect is finding new sources of the minerals. You know, obviously the more mineral sources you find, the more sustainable that particular mineral will be. While there's things like deep sea mining and biological mining, which they mention in the book, that might be alternative options. Now, if you don't know what deep sea mining is, <clears throat> Down on the ocean floor, um, in many parts of the ocean, are what are called manganese nodules. These big chunks of rock that are very high in manganese and other metals that are just laying on the ocean floor because of how the ocean floor was formed. Okay, those that all of that material came up through some vent or something millions of years ago and created this chunk of rock that's really high in manganese and other metals. Well, the problem is, is it's very expensive to go down, you know, six, seven, eight, nine thousand feet in water to go get these things. Right now, it's not economically viable, but they're working on solutions to be able to go get this. And biological mining is something I had never heard of. I read in the book about taking, like, if you have desalinization, which is taking ocean water and converting it to fresh water. So you have this brine left over with all this stuff in there, including salt and other metals, taking that and using this particular bacteria to extract out the other minerals. It's a pretty neat concept somebody came up with. The big question then is, is mining, sustainable mining achievable? Well, globally, you know, historically, mines have been notoriously bad for the environment and left scars and, you know, toxic water, toxic air. It's just they, they've gotten a really black eye and for good reason, um, because they just did for many hundreds of years, they didn't care. Well, globally, they're under more pressure now to start cleaning up their act. However, the mines are in it for the profit and therefore they're slow to respond. And a lot of times, especially in places like China, you have the government's finger on everything as well. <clears throat> so mining will only be sustainable if society meets its mining and mineral needs more responsibly and by protecting the environment workers and surrounding communities. Well, that's, that's great. The problem is again, there's a lot more factors involved here, obviously bottom line, supply and demand. Um, you know, it, 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 the rare earths are a perfect example of, you know, there's a boom in that particular sector. And so it's go get it at all costs, regardless of how it's being done, um, both environmentally and from a human aspect. So that's not good either. Um, now transitioning from a linear economy to a circular one where you have more, uh, we're a bit, we're very much a throwaway society, which is it's produced, it's used, and then it's thrown away, right? That's your linear, your economy right now. We throw everything away. It's cheaper to throw away your TV when it breaks down than it is to buy a new one. The prices have come down so far. I'm guilty. I've done it. I'm sure most of you have as well. However, we could take that and make it more circular where you have things that are built for longevity, they can be repaired. That's the other thing. The new TVs are very difficult to repair. You used to have lots of TV repairmen. Now there's one 
you very rarely see them because the new TVs are very difficult to take apart and work on. Can they be reused in some form or fashion and obviously recycled? How do you get those, those rare earth minerals, for example, out of your TVs and cell phones so they can be reused, then they don't need to be extracted back out of the ground? Now, what I want these images that you see here um, would have worked really well in the last slide as well. This is a reclaimed salt mine in Poland, near Krakow, Poland, which is um, over in Europe. What they did is they took this old salt mine and converted it and carved it into these beautiful, it's pretty crazy. Go look this up. It's a, you know, just look in salt mine uh, carved Poland or something like that. And all of these statues and religious things, and the, the one on the bottom is an actual cathedral. It's an entire cathedral carved into salt. And uh, it's pretty cool. So that was what they did with their leftover salt mine. They reclaimed it, repurposed it, and now it's a World Heritage Site um, listed on the World Heritage Sites. And it, people come from all over the world to see this thing. And it is. It's really beautiful if you go look at more pictures of it. Um, so it's pretty cool. There. So that's the end of this chapter. Um, forests and minerals play a massive role in our everyday lives. Uh, we need paper products, we need mineral products, but how do we sustain them in the long haul is going to be, you know, a lot of it is policy driven, a lot of it is just consumer, how do you change the minds of the consumers, and in the case of like deforestation, how do you convince somebody who's trying to survive not to do something that could affect the entire world, how do you explain that to them? So there's a lot of questions and not a whole lot of answers, unfortunately. But slowly but surely, people are working on these problems. There are people out there that are trying really hard because if you figure out how to do it, you'll make money. How do you reuse cell phones? How do you get those, uh, you know, because cell phones are all over the place now, right? How do you get those rare earth minerals out of cell phones? How do you get the precious metals, metals out of cell phones? There's a lot of metal in cell phones. Now, it might be microscopic amounts in the circuit boards and transistor, transistors and all of that, but they all have value. And with the pure number of cell phones that are being dumped every day, that can start to add up. And the first person that really makes it a viable option is going to make some serious money. Well, I learned a lot out of this chapter, and I hope you did too. I thought it was this was the second half with the minerals was pretty easy for me to write because being a geologist, I, I already know a lot of this stuff. But I also learned about you know the rare earth mines and the blood diamonds a bit more. And I got to tell you, go look up this this cathedral in uh, Poland. It's pretty cool. The, whoever did that is just phenomenal talent. All right, that's it for chapter seven, and I'll see you on the next one.